Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger, um, and we have just done some math because we wanted to find out how tall Nebuchadnezzar's statue was that he set up in Daniel chapter 3. How, how tall did we decide it was? Well, the text says three score cubits, so that's 60 times one and a half feet, so that's 90 feet tall, and it's six cubits wide, so that's nine feet wide. Uh, I think this, the surprising thing for most people, it was for me the first time I actually paid attention to the numbers, is this is not a, a humanoid figure. This is tall and skinny. It's and not a giant chocolate bunny. Probably not, no. Um, it's more like an obelisk, and when we were talking about this before we officially started, you mentioned the Washington Monument, which is, how tall is it again? 555 feet and five and one eighth inches. <laughs> so there you have comparison. This was um, tall, impressive, covered in gold, probably not solid gold because that would be an awful lot of gold. I'm not sure if there is that much gold around. But it was bright and shiny, and Nebuchadnezzar set it up in the plains of Dura, someplace in the province of Babylon. And then this is what the text says. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together into the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they I feel like this needs to be a children's book. <laughs> and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Yes. More than one <laughs> real commentator has said, this is sheer mockery. This is on the level of this is the house that Jack built. It's the same lengthy set of nouns over and over again with that popular refrain that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. I know when I read this out loud at any length to my students, at some point they start laughing because it's just so silly. It's not that God's silly or the Bible's silly. God is mocking this whole thing because they're making such a big deal out of it. And we can remember back to the original Tower of Babel where God also mocked them in good detail. Oh, they're building something which is to heaven. Let's go down and see if we can even see the whatever that <laughs> thing is. Oh, okay. God yeah, they... who sits in the heavens laughs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so again, God, God is laughing and mocking at all this. And the herald cries aloud, to you it's commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, heart, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at the time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Okay context within the flow of the book of Daniel. In the previous chapter, Nebuchadnezzar had had this stream of a great image, terrible, huge, humanoid in shape, which perhaps has led some artists, and particularly those who do children's Bible storybooks, I think, um, to portray it as uh, an image of gold, that is a human image, but it's, it's not. The proportions are completely wrong. Um, as you suggested either before, since we started, I don't remember, a totem pole perhaps, or something with a small image on them. We're not told. It doesn't matter, obviously, or God would have given us more detail. But there is a connection to the previous chapter, and that's that in the original dream and then the vision as Daniel saw it, the head of gold represented Babylon, and particularly Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar knows that Babylon is not the be-all and end-all of human history. But he does latch onto one thing. I'm the head of gold. <laughs> it all starts with me. And from here it goes downhill. I am the clearest manifestation of God in history. People ought to acknowledge that. God went to all the trouble to point this out to me. And now I need to point it out to everybody. And within the context of that culture, if God manifests himself in some person or thing, then God is identified with that person or thing. 
again, continuity of being theology. All being is one, something, everything's divine, some things are just a little more divine than others. Back to the old um, cream of wheat or oatmeal analogy. <laughs> and um, it, it is right that people recognize this and give me the honor due to my unique place in history. It is sad, he probably thought, that things go downhill from here, but there's nothing strange about that later on, or would it be earlier? It'd be slightly earlier, I guess, that um, Hesiod would describe human history in terms of a flow from a golden age to a silver age to a bronze age to an iron age. So the language was had some currency even, even now, and the recognition that things rise out of chaos into a glorious beginning and then descend cyclically back down into chaos. That was all familiar territory. The news was, hey, we're at the peak. I'm it. I'm golden, literally. I am... I am the manifestation of God on earth right now, and people need to acknowledge that if we're going to get on with this great social engineering problem called the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the Chaldean Empire. And in that culture, you did so by bowing down to images and maybe offering sacrifices or incense to them. But you start with prostrating yourself before the image which uh, incarnates the, the glory, the reality that is God. So, in uh, probably in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, he's just go he's just going where God led me thus far. Obviously, this is the thing you do next. He's probably wholly justified in his mind, and he's working off of a divinely given dream. What more do you need? God, God almost told me to do it. So, people need to get on board with this. Oddly enough, everybody gets on board with this because the word goes out that if you don't, you're going to be thrown into a, a burning, <laughs> fiery furnace. And not, not that the people probably would have objected anyway. They were used to bowing down all kinds of things because uh, this is a polytheistic culture. God is manifest in many ways, in many means, many um, objects, many, many kinds of talismans, idols, and images. So bowing down to one more is no big deal. But Nebuchadnezzar wants to punctuate and say, this is really, really important. So you all, everyone has to be on board here because God is manifested in the emperor, in the empire, in this political arrangement, and you all have to recognize that because we can't go forward the way we're supposed to if you don't. And we don't need any compromisers, quizlings. Judas's. We need complete loyalty for for everybody. Everybody must swear allegiance to the state, and they manifest it by bowing down to this image. And he has a whole orchestra just to make it more spectacular and interesting and get people involved, apparently. And the music plays, and everyone bows down. All across the field, all across the plane, it's just like, what? Everybody's doing the wave, except here the wave is kneel before this image. <laughs> But somewhere, somehow, you, you know how it is when the when the child comes to you after class and says, teacher, did you know that Bobby had his eyes open during prayer? <laughs> um, how do you know yeah, this child? How do you, how do you, <laughs> yes, exactly. There were some people in that, in that audience who noticed that there were some people not bowing. The people who did the noticing were probably Chaldean by extraction, locals, natives, People who should have been in line for high positions in the Babylonian government and probably had some kind of position because this, this was a meeting of, of the officials of the empire. Uh, but uh, the people who were not bowing were three Hebrews. Uh, and their uh, Babylonian names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. As you recall, those were not their Hebrew names. Their Hebrew names were what? Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah. But no one knew them as that anymore. The names had been changed. They were part of the system. They dressed like Babylonians. They talked like Babylonians. They went to Babylonian classes. They got ab ab they graduated from Babylon U. They worked for the Babylonian civil service. And yet, you know, just that itchy thing of, but they're Hebrews and they're ahead of me. <laughs> it's called envy or greed or covetousness. Envy is a little different. And envy says, I don't necessarily want that position but it really burns me that he has it. So they see these guys and they decide, there we go. We got them. They're, they're so far out of line. Now, the king has made such a big deal out of this. We know they're teacher's pets and all that, but they're not going to get away with this. And so the text continues. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near 
and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man shall that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews, Judeans, whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, which is not exactly relevant here, but they throw it in just on top of things. They serve not thy gods, and nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So these are the tattlers. <laughs> they pretend that this is out of loyalty to the king and his cause and the political movement and, you know, all that. But their their motives are purely personal. They want these guys out of the way. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, <sighs> there's nothing worse than a man who's committed to his religion of self-righteousness. Because if you've crossed him, you've crossed God himself. And he is now fully justified in whatever anger and vengeance he displays. So Nebuchadnezzar's were really ticked off. He commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they brought them into the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I've set up. Now, the God, again, the gods thing has not been an issue. No one has ever told them, as far as we know, that they have to worship the Babylonian gods. But right now, it it's just shows bad taste. It's like walking into a, a formal ball in your beachwear. You know, you're not fitting in. You're obviously slighting the whole audience, and it's just something that comes up here. That, But more to the point, nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now, if you be ready, he's now he's going to be magnanimous and generous. He's cooled down enough to offer them a second chance. Now, if you be ready, then, at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast that same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Boom, boom, boom. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful. We're full of care. We're not anxious about our answer, to answer thee in this matter. Doesn't mean that, that, that they don't care about their lives or that they're going to speak thoughtlessly. It just uh, this, is, we're, this is not a worry to us. We already know what we're doing, and so we're going from there. Uh, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. So, again... We're, we're in the position where they have not been told God's going to work a miracle. They are, strictly speaking, not prophets in that they, the, the last thing that was revealed was revealed to Daniel. The miracle was done on their behalf, but they didn't do the miracle. So they don't have any kind of divine revelation that says, go put your life on the line because nothing's going to happen. God's going to step in and deliver you. They may have a sense that God has used them so far, and that having used them, maybe he's not done yet. But that's not the point. Yes, God can, and we may even have a sneaking suspicion that he's planning something like this, because this is a huge confrontation. You were totally... And, and again, they could look back to the, the whole story of Joseph. Mm -hmm. When Joseph interpreted the dream of the king, the king got on board and converted. Here, Nebuchadnezzar completely misunderstands the message, is running in the wrong direction, and they may deduce amongst themselves, God's not done here. Why would God mm. tell him all this? Just as God had a great big showdown with the Egyptian gods, something, yeah. might, be, something might be coming. Something might be coming here. So maybe God's not done with us. Um, everyone at this point usually asks, where's Daniel? We don't know. We're not told. Obviously, he didn't bow down. 
He may have been off on an embassage or managing affairs back in the city proper while someone had to be in charge while everybody else is out here. <laughs> Maybe he uh, found himself a job where nobody would be seeing him <laughs> at this particular time. We don't yeah, know. we don't know. Does And it doesn't matter. And no, it's not a figure of the rapture where Daniel <laughs> vanishes, but others are left behind. I've heard that before. Wow. Um, it's just, you know, you start looking. When, when you start believing in, in such things, you start finding them every place. Anyhow, <laughs> you know, the same thing with lines in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are gone, but Daniel's left behind. Anyway, no, that's not <laughs> serious, but no, people, please, no. Um, so Daniel maybe found a workaround or something. But yeah, he, he, but Hanan these guys Shadrach couldn't. He's, he's at a higher level than they are. And he could not apparently rescue them. He couldn't intervene. Because if he could have, he would have. He's that kind of guy. So they're on their <laughs> own, except they're not. And that's the whole point. God's on their side. And whereas they may have some kind of sneak and suspicion that God's about to do something, they they don't know. They're, they don't have an infallible prophetic guarantee. And so it is quite possible that what God has planned is their martyrdom here and now, and that he's going to glorify himself that way. So they they say, our God whom we serve, is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us out of your hand, if that's his plan. If that's the way he, if he wants to deliver us, he's delivering us, and there's nothing you can do to stop him. So he's sovereign, you're not. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Since the whole issue of the gods has been dragged in, they're dragging it, they're, they're acknowledging it. You, you keep making this point. It's not being an issue. We're going to make it an issue. Because when this is done, if we're still alive, we're still not worshiping your gods. Mm -hmm. It's not It's not. we're going to defy idolatry one idol at a time. Well, how about this one? No. Well, but you could you could battle this one. No. How about this one over here? No, they're just flat out, look, let's settle this once and for all. Not this image, not your gods, none of it. We are rejecting the whole of Babylonian idolatry. And um, that's just it. We're not going to do it. Now, to some, this would sound like sheer arrogance. Uh, the man is asking you to get down on your knees and do a salam or two in the direction of this thing. What's the big deal? Because he's going to kill you and it's going to hurt. It's going to be nasty. And people are going to see that this is what happens to people who defile idol defy idolatry. How is that going to be helpful? Can, can't you just go along, get along? I mean, buy, buy, bow down and tie a shoe or something. <laughs> Live to fight another day. Yeah, exactly. Is it, is it really that big a deal? I mean, as long as you don't believe in those idols in your heart, does what your body do really matter? Hmm. Huh. Gnostic and Bell. This, yeah, this <laughs> this conversation just came around to today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can we, as long as my intentions are good, as long as my theology is good, as long as my commitments are right, as long as there's love in my heart, does it really matter what I do externally, what religious images I put forward, what symbols I carry around, um, what... Um, memes I put up on my uh, social media account. Does any of that really matter as long as my heart is right? And these men knew the law of God very well. Th th it's not so much that they knew it really well, it's that we know it so poorly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the statistics are, but the number of people, the number of Christians, people who go to church regularly who know the Ten Commandments is desperately low. Most American Christians cannot tell you what the Ten Commandments are, let alone in order, let alone recite them. It's 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 very sad that we are so ignorant of what God requires. And then there are those who also not knowing the law, and I, I kind of mentioned this I think last time, who will object to the idea of law. Well, we we serve because of the promptings of the Spirit. We don't need the book telling us what to do. And if you see, so which commandment exactly are you having trouble with? <laughs> Is it the one about adultery? Well, no, of course not. Okay. Oh, you want to be able to lie to your neighbor that, no, if I don't want, <laughs> you want to kill somebody, you knock off your boss because he's, no, I don't. So which, do you even, you keep talking about law and how bad law is. Do you even know what these laws command? Well, I'm in favor of them all generally. It's just that God shouldn't tell us to these things. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> I'm see, reminded of a scene from the Jane Austen movie Love and Friendship, mm-hmm. where the there's this sort of country bumpkin, but of course this is Jane Austen, so he's landed gentry. Of course, but he he doesn't know as he calls them the Twelve Commandments, <laughs> and so somebody says, "You know there are only ten and he goes. <gasps> Oh, that's great news. Which two shall we do away with? <laughs> and he starts going through. But many of these things we wouldn't do anyway because they are wrong. <laughs> and it's it's sad, but it's funny. But it's funny because it's true that we, yeah. we don't know what they they are. We, that we're supposed to be, you know, Christian civilization. And here we are thinking, oh, no, but I wouldn't do those things. Not because God told me not to, but because they're wrong. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. There's some kind of absolute that stands outside of the universe that even God must consult. And we don't want God bossing us around. And God, since he became a Christian and all, doesn't try to boss us around. He just he puts his spirit in us and moves us in ways that are kind and loving. And no, it's not that we're, we want to break any of these commandments exactly, but we just don't like it when people tell us we need to not do these things. We don't need a book. We don't need well, a book. God kind of thought we did. Yeah, God, <laughs> That's why he God, gave us one. <laughs> God did. And the first two commandments, if anyone does not know, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Before me means where I can see them, before my face, before my presence. That is, and since God is everywhere, no gods, where, no, no, gods no, no rival authorities, no other ultimate concerns except God himself, where God can see them which is anywhere at all. So that's that's the first commandment. That which commands your life, your loyalty, your um, commitments in all areas of thought and life, that must be Jehovah in his word. The second commandment is, thou shalt make unto thee, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, that means an idol. It's a very, it's a technical term, it's a very specific meaning. Or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above the earth, beneath the waters, under the earth. That's the first command. Don't make idols of anything, of any kind of shape, whatever you can imagine, whatever you've seen. Don't try to equate something and say, God looks like this. Secondly, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Those are two separate things, but they're bound up together. In other words, if I say, well, I'm going to make this picture of God, but I'm not going to myself bow down to it. I'll just put it over here in a corner because it's going to look really cool. It's not no. that I'm worshiping it. <laughs> <laughs> not worshiping it. I just made it. Maybe someone else might, might worship it. Well, no, I'll make sure they don't. I'll, I'll just, I'll save it for special people who can appreciate fine art. Yeah, no, don't make it. Because what you're doing here is misrepresenting God. God is not like any of the... Yes, he is like everything that he has made, and he is not like anything he has made. Everything bears witness to him. Everything reveals him. The heavens declare the glory of God, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by means of the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead. Yes, everything testifies to God, but God is not exactly like any of them. God is not a cow. He is not a giraffe. He is not the sun. He is not the Milky Way. He is not the planet Earth. He is not a human king. No, nothing. There is nothing we can make that exhausts who and what God is. And when we say, when we make a statue, an image, a painting, and say, well, this is God, we are now lying about God. We are misrepresenting him. We're not telling the truth about him. We are telling an untruth about him. That is, we are lying about who God is. And you may remember God's words to Job's friends at the end of the book of Job. My wrath is kindled against you because you have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job has. God does not like to be misrepresented. He wants us to tell the truth. He is truth. He expects us to bear witness to that truth and not to make up our own stuff because it's cool or beautiful or shows off my talent or whatever. He just says, don't, I don't see the harm in it, though. It doesn't matter if you don't see the harm in it. You're not listening. Well, no one will ever get bad ideas because I, I, I'll put it in a book and just bring it out. No, you won't because you're, you're, now you're coveting and now you're obsessing and now you're putting your little art project ahead of God's clear words. God does not want you even to yourself making 
physical or even mental images of what God might look like. Because one, he doesn't look like anything. He's intangible and invisible. And anything that you come up with, again, is going to represent, misrepresent God, not only to others, but to you yourself. You're going to start thinking that God is like this created thing. So that's that. And then secondly, once these things are made, whether you made it or someone else made it, don't worship it. Don't bow down to it for exactly the same reason. God is not in anything that he has made. Nothing exhausts his reality. Yes, he's present everywhere. He's imminent. Uh, all of God is with us anywhere we turn, but he is not his creation. Dr. Rudolph from um, Episcopal Seminary had a saying, he is not it, and it is not he. He draw a big circle, that's God. And then he draw a little circle, that's creation. Point to the first circle, God. He is not it, pointing at creation. And it, pointing at creation, is not he. And then he would show the covenantal link between the two, but no crossing of boundaries, no continuity of being, no continuity of essence. Uh, Dr. Rudolph had another line, another line that I like. God makes ducks, but God does not quack. <laughs> By which he simply meant God makes his creation, but does not therefore thereby become his creation. Mm -hmm. He makes ducks, but that doesn't reduce him to the level of a duck. God makes the sun, but he is not therefore the sun. God made the earth, but he is not the earth. And so when we try to make things and say, this is my contact point with God, God is in this or, or reaches out through this in a special way, then we're violating the second commandment. Uh, I've used the example with my kids. I pull out a cell phone, which I actually do have now. <laughs> and I turn to my students and say, what if I turn to you and, you know, I, it rang and I pick it up and I answer, hello, oh, and I turn to you and say, it's your mom. And I'm holding out the cell phone. Now, do I Dude, mean... my dad is not a phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But we all know what it means. We mean that this thing has now become an insta-connect to mom, wherever she may be. And we that voice that we hear, it's coming from your mom. Yes, it's been changed through electric signals, electric, electronic particles, and so on, and all that, by air vibrations. It's not the original breath your mom breathed, but it's a good representation of it. And if you disobey her, she's going to find out, and you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So for all practical purposes at that moment, that cell phone is acting like mom, and you better treat it as such. And if you flip the cell phone a finger or something, uh, mom's going to know, and mom's going to deal with you. You cannot trash the phone when your mom's on the line and think that mom doesn't care. So the, for the ancient world, this was the nature of idols. It was. Yeah, they understood that the you know the wooden thing that they made was not the power that they were trying to get yeah. on the good side of. They understood it was a representation. Yeah, it's a representation yeah. and a hyperlink. But but that doesn't mean you you don't show the proper respect, and the proper respect was bowing, yeah. offering incense, bringing sacrifices, maybe your firstborn child. It, 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 it was that simple. And so this is what's being held before these three Hebrew young men, who by now were probably 21, 22, something like that. They're, they're probably still in their early 20s. Uh, they have, they can acknowledge that there is something in this world more important to them than serving the Lord their God, and they can acknowledge that whatever gods there be, whether it be their own god or another god, has manifested himself to such a degree, has identified himself so clearly with this one particular object that they can bow to him, to it, and thereby show him honor. And he not only will not be displeased, he will actually be pleased because the connection is that close. If you say to the cell phone, yes, mom, I'll do that, mom on the other end is pleased. Not because you've honored the cell phone, but because through the cell phone you've honored her. And so God or the gods, if you understand them right, they they they, they look and see how you treat these, these hyperlinks to divinity. And if you do the right thing, somehow they reserve or they receive the, the the nourishment, the power, the what, however it works in their particular system of thought. So, at the very least, these two lie, these two laws, these two commandments are on the line. And the young men say, "No. God may deliver us. He has the power. He may not. Doesn't matter. We're not bowing down to this or any other creature." Now, the one exception, of course, would be human beings, because man is the image of God. And if you bow down to a man as a man, 
And we have numerous examples of the patriarchs, for example, doing exactly that. That's simply showing respect for, for what is the image of God, human nature. But to bow down and offer incense and make sacrifices and to call another human being Lord and Savior, now that's that's right out. <laughs> um, that's violating still the first commandment, treating something else as if it is truly God and sovereign. Well, Nebuchadnezzar does not take this well. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their hose and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the fi burning, fiery furnace. Now, if you listen to those words, there's something already is a little odd. The fire is so hot, it consumes the soldiers who try to throw them into the fire. So they're running around burning to death or are taken in a moment. And yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego mm. fall down, uh, bound. So the fire, as hot it is, as it is, has not instantly consumed their clothes in, the, in which they were bound. It hasn't I'm instantly reminded consumed them. Of the, of the burning bush. Yeah. As if the fire burns and yet does not consume. Hmm. Well, while everybody's watching at some distance, we would think, because it's really, really hot, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished. And he rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said, um, True, okay. He answered and said, Lo, I see... Four men, loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Well, <clears throat> apparently, um, it, the fire did not consume them, but somebody undid their uh, bindings for them, and then helped them up, and they put their clothes on. <laughs> and as Nebuchadnezzar is seeing this and watching, you know, they're getting dressed and adjusting their hats and everything. And um, he sees this and, and is absolutely astound, astonished. Where did this that we put? Well, they put in three, right? I'm not. It's not early dementia, <laughs> is it? And where did this fourth guy come from? And who and what is he? He says, the fourth, the King James says, is like the Son of God. And uh, commentators. Um, since probably the mid-1800s, have picked at that and said, well, Nebuchadnezzar is not uh, a Hebrew or a Christian. He does not have a conception of God having a son. Even the Hebrews were not terribly clear on that. <laughs> they did use the phrase son of God sometimes for angels, but even that was not a common usage. And so the plea is, Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan, he's a Babylonian. What he probably said was a son of the gods. That is... Um, a demigod, a, a hero, some hum, human form that has elements of deity about it. Now, that's probably true as far as it goes. Nebuchadnezzar had not studied the theology of Nicaea or any such thing. He had not read Burkhoff's Manual of Christian Doctrine, let alone Calvin's Institutes, or the writings of Athanasius or Augustine. He did not know about all of that. But the God who ordains all things had recorded or had ordained that he would say particular words and ordained that the Holy Spirit would, in Scripture, those particular words, knowing full well what those <laughs> words would mean in about 500 years. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're absolutely justified in translating them as they are here. Whatever Nebuchadnezzar meant, God is communicating to us that, yes, the fourth person there was the Son of God. It's Jesus as a Christophany or Theophany appearing uh, in a pre-incarnation revelation. In other words, it's the Son of God looking as if he's human for the moment. The angel of the Lord appearing. And 
and and notice what he does what he does and what he doesn't do. He obviously is preserving them because they're not running around screaming about how hot it is. <laughs> um, they're not burning. They're not being consumed. I really appreciate your reference to the, the burning bush earlier because that's exactly, I think, what we should be thinking of. The flame is burning and yet it's not consuming them. Would it consume someone else? Absolutely. It consumed the guards who tried to throw them in here in the first place. The problem's not with fire. God There's is upholding them. There's something special about this bush. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And about the men that God has allowed to come there. And so God himself in the person of his son, has joined with them and is preserving them and keeping the flame from hurting them. But he also is not leading them out. He's staying with them. And that's the third thing. He's staying with them. They're in this fire. And yet it doesn't touch them and it doesn't touch him. But he stays with them and he does not lead them out yet. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the echoes here, we, we can think, when you think backwards and forwards, when you think backwards to the Exodus, uh, in Deuteronomy 4.20, Moses, or God through Moses said, but the Lord hath taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be a people unto him of inheritance as you are this day. Egypt was a fiery furnace. Hmm. Well, now they're in they're in another pagan land, Babylon. They've gone back even further, back to where Abraham came out of. Mm -hmm. and there again, God's people are in a fiery furnace. It's a time of torment, a time of tribulation. And Isaiah had seen such a, such a thing coming, and he wrote in chapter forty three, "When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you." The language is largely figurative, but that doesn't mean it's not absolutely, literally real at certain times. And this is one <laughs> of those times. There, God's people are in Babylon, and specifically three of them are in this fiery furnace. Babylon's a fiery furnace, but here's a real practical down-to-earth, you can burn your hand on a fiery furnace, and God's people are there. Well, what happens to God's people when they go in a fiery furnace? Jesus is with them, and Jesus preserves them, and one day Jesus leads them out. But here's the other thing. Jesus is in the fiery furnace. He does not say, wow, well, you know, that's really hot. I'm going to stay out here <laughs> um, while you, you I'll, I'll make sure you don't hurt too much, but I, yeah, that's just a little uncomfortable. I'll, Sending I'll, I'll... thoughts and prayers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it, toward the, the end of the historical part of the book, Daniel's going to go into the lion's den, and the imagery is very similar. Because Babylon is also compared in Daniel's later prophecies to a lion. Well, God's people are in the lion's den. Mm -hmm. And Daniel goes in there, and he, but he's not devoured. And God in time brings him out again. And so with our Lord, just as Israel went into captivity and is eventually restored to the land and the restoration, our Savior went into the fiery furnace of God's wrath of desolation, isolation, rejection, pain, suffering. And he came out again. He went in there for us. He comes out for us. And so now when we go through such things, we know he's been there and done that. And we have that absolute comfort that he is with us. And before he left the earth, one of his last words were, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. Even to the end of the age. So that's something of what's going on here. It is more than just, yeah, God stepped in and screwed up Nebuchadnezzar's plans. Yes, he did. <laughs> it's, it's a little more than God doesn't like the power state and world empires and new world orders. No, he really doesn't, as a matter of fact, and tends to poke fun at them and puncture them whenever he can. But it doesn't mean that sometimes his people don't have to suffer in the midst of such nonsense. And sometimes for quite a while, again... Jesus did not bring these three men out immediately. Daniel didn't bounce back out of the lion's den the moment he was thrown in. Sometimes we are there for a while, and yet God, Jesus, promises to be with us and to sustain us, and promises this is part of the plan. So don't worry about it. It's okay. Got you covered. This reminds me of Paul in in jail mm -hmm. when uh, he's been you know publicly humiliated and cast mm -hmm. into jail, and then they find out that they can't really keep him in jail because he's a Roman <laughs> citizen. And he says, well, you threw me in here publicly, so you come and get me out. I'm yeah. not coming. <laughs> so it just reminds me because, you know, Paul is in imprisoned. Yeah. 
in the same way, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they're imprisoned in yes. a safe place. That you know, yeah. the 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 furnace is the <laughs> safest place in the world if you're with <laughs> Jesus and Jesus is there, you know? And so I, I feel like if I were one of those three people, I, I would like to think that I'd be like, yo, come and get me. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah that that's a wonderful observation because you're 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 right that there's a there's a good deal of similarity. They don't leave until Nebuchadnezzar calls them out. Because mm -hmm. you know what? Nebuchadnezzar is still the emperor, and he told him to go in there. Okay, boss, we're here. Now what? You were supposed to die. Well, you've been overruled on that one. So <laughs> um, what's next? So <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar gets that he's been overruled, that heaven has somehow intervened. It does not mean that he knows who exactly Jesus is, but he knows that someone who represents the God of the Hebrews, has just intervened in a big way that he can't trump. And so he says this, Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace. So some time has passed because he's able to get a lot closer now. Mm -hmm. And spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. So they're going to faithfully obey their lawful ruler, <laughs> and the princes and governors and captains, kings, counselors being gathered together, saw these men upon whom the bodies, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. No evidence that they had ever been in the fire. They are dressed right now, though. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel, his messenger, and delivered his servants that trusted in him, have changed the king's word, yeah, hmm. and yielded their bodies that they may not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Okay, you have properly analyzed the situation. <laughs> and, and that's to his credit, because not everybody would. There are people who would say, well, that didn't work. Try Spears. Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, he realizes, uh, here, here's the king of the world. And he realizes, um, I'm outgunned here, and it would be wisdom not to push it. I got into this thinking I was doing the will of this God of heaven person, and he just said no to me. So... Let's put the pride down just a notch and let's uh, work the system. I'm thinking here of Jeroboam when he uh, is confronted by the prophet who breaks his altar hmm. by prophetic voice. And he reaches out his hands and says, seize him. And then his hand brivels up. He immediately turns back and says, um, don't hey, seize him. <laughs> don't seize him. Hey, bud, come here. Uh, would you mind healing me, please? And uh, thanks so much. And now why don't you come back with me and I'll... I'll uh, give you a honorary uh, testimonial dinner or something, give you rewards and all that. And the prophet says, no. <laughs> that, that whole attempt to co-op. Well, this is neither that nor the other. Um, it's not, not, well, okay, that didn't work when a sword threw him. Nor is it, oh, you are good luck charms. But neither is it true conversion because that waits for the next chapter. But what he says is significant. He says this. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. So he realizes that this God is different. Now, has he assumed a full creationist theology? Probably not. <laughs> but it's things are beginning to get through to him. He he knew that there was something special about this God from the previous chapter. He really he, he he's now saying, "Don't anybody say even a bad word about him." I don't need that on my resume. So we're going to honor this God. He is the Most High God. He's higher than all other gods. He has power that no other God has. Um, he's still thinking about what that means and what that practically what that comes down to. And in the next chapter, God is setting him up for conversion, but it hasn't happened yet. The king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So they get knocked up a few notches in authority, and I'm sure the people who originally um, tattled on them are probably thinking, oh no, they're going to know, they're going to remember we're in trouble. Maybe it's time to <laughs> seek a transfer to uh, 
you know, India or someplace. So there's the story. And the, the interesting thing about Daniel is that it is laid out in, in preset sections. Most of the Bible, the, if there are sections, they're literarily determined, they're not hard and fast, and you have to kind of think, okay, what, where are the themes and where are the main ideas and, and motifs coming in? There are a few that come in, preset chapters. Psalms is obvious. Lamentations mm-hmm. is another. Uh, revelation to a lesser extent. John has its seven signs it's built around, and so on. The chapters of Daniel are very concise stories, and there are 10 of them, five and five, and they parallel each other. This chapter corresponds to the sixth chapter, where Daniel again is faced with, do I serve the king or do I serve God? That's the lion's den story. Chapter 2 is parallel to 7, and the prophecies are very similar. Chapter 2 is the coming four kingdoms in terms of a human image. Daniel 7 is the coming four kingdoms in terms of great beasts that rise out of the ocean, and so on. And that's another study. But what it means for this is that this is the third. This The first one settles absolute priorities. You're going to serve God, you're going to serve the king. The second is how is God review, reviewing himself historically? And the third then is, so what, what does this mean in terms of how I shall then live? Um, what, what is the nature of my oath before God? Mm-hmm. I'm a Christian. I've been baptized. I've been marked with Jesus' name. I come to the Holy Supper uh, and renew my covenant with him on a yearly, monthly, or weekly basis, depending on who you are. Um, what does that mean for how I live? and how I interact with society, how I interact with uh, the government. Here's the civil government. These men held posts within the civil government. This is a very wicked civil government. This is a government that was a war machine. It was out conquering people's left and right. The bulk of the wealth that came into its coffers came from brutal conquest of people who had not particularly hurt Babylon. They were just there to be conquered. This money came into the hands of Daniel and his friends. It's blood money. What do you do with that? Mm-hmm. Do you just say, I can't touch that? I can't work for this government? This government is absolutely pagan. I have no place in it. I can't be involved in it. Or do you say, God has put me here and I will do what I can do. But then the other side is, and will you do everything they ask you to do? You Think of Obadiah who worked for Ahab. Somehow, this godly man got to be Ahab's second in, in command, his right-hand man. Meanwhile, in the background, he was hiding prophets at Jezebel's expense in caves to keep them from martyrdom. <laughs> um, so a great guy, great uh, administrator, Ahab no doubt thought he was very faithful and very useful. And, and there he is walking that tightrope. And here these men are walking, also walking the tightrope. They are government officials. And for if any of you have family or friends who tell you, I, I have nothing to do with the, with the United States government, it is evil and wicked, and I won't work for it, won't work under it, won't obey it, won't acknowledge its existence. I am, oh, I don't know, a sovereign citizen. <clears throat> <laughs> you know, like people who are citizens of Atlantis or something. Um, there's nothing biblical there. These, these men have been taken by force out of God's land, from God's people, from their godly families, placed in a pagan environment, given a peg, pagan education by force. I mean, the, 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 the Babylonians were nice about it, but they, these men had no choice but to do what they were told. But now there comes a point where they, there is a point where the line is drawn. Will you bow down and say that this government is beyond question, can make any law at once, can demand your absolute obedience, that can you, will you swear that Caesar is Lord? Or will you stand back and say, no, before you do that, you have to kill me, and I'll stand right here while you do it, and I will bear witness to the truth. We don't know to what degree they bore testimony before Nebuchadnezzar before this. Probably not a lot. <clears throat> they didn't have that many opportunities. Daniel had with the whole interpreting the dream, but God had to provide that opportunity. And it's not necessarily our job to go up to our pagan employees in the government every week and say, hey, let me tell you what Jesus is doing in my life now. If you can, go for it. 
generally you're going to be told, just shut up and get back to work. But when God provides the opportunity, these men are not shy. They are not afraid, not embarrassed to be named followers of Jehovah. They tell the truth, and though it may cost them their lives, they stand there boldly and take it. And when they're told to go into the fiery furnace, they walk in. And they walk in not screaming and yelling and calling the king names, doing particular hand motions in his direction. They walk in, and they walk in, and they find Jesus is waiting for them. So Mm -hmm. there should be great encouragement to us in Mm -hmm. our age when we are surrounded by all kinds of pagan forces and ideas and communities and thought patterns. God has not lost control. We may be in a fiery furnace, but Jesus is here with us. And uh, when he's ready, he will lead us out. In the meantime, enjoy the ride. (laughs) Action movies are always the most exciting, right? (laughs) That doesn't mean I want to live in one. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much. We should transition to recommendations. We should do that. And um, before we had settled on one thing for me to recommend, but I remembered something else that I wanted to recommend. Okay. Well, you go for it. We'll save the recipe for next week. Okay. Spoilers. Um, My recommendation is a song and an album for the Christmas season. Um, The group is called Over the Rhine. It's Hmm. a husband and wife um, from Ohio. And they are really amazing musicians. Um, But they have several Christmas albums. Uh, One of them is called The Darkest Night of the Year. And... It's partially irrelevant because I just remembered that's not the one that the track is on that I wanted to recommend. But that's also a good one. But the song I want to recommend is called The Trumpet Child. And it's haunting and beautiful and lovely. Okay. The Trumpet Child by Over the Rhine. All right. So my recommendation, when I first wrote the original article, was for a friend of mine, Bill Hyde. Uh, and it it started with um, reminders of uh, two characters who stand before the Spanish Inquisition and have to maintain their Protestant faith in the face of possible, well, certain, as far as they know, torture and, and then death afterwards. But that was uh, one of the first stories that Bill produced. It's His uh, company is called Heirloom Audio, Heirloom Audio Productions. You can find it online. And they do, well, guess what? Audio productions. They do <laughs> uh, stories. They're, they're, they're borrowing from um, uh, G.H. Hinty, who was who wrote um, Victorian, or G.A. Hinty, rather, who wrote boys' adventure stories in the mm-hmm. late Victorian and early 20th century age. And uh, well, the first one is under Drake's flag. Two young men end up... As prisoners of the Inquisition, and somewhere along the line, I forget how it happens, they meet Francis Drake, and it, it's it's very well done. Uh, they they use professional musicians, professional score writers, Hollywood actors, or British actors, better yet. And there there is always this uh, dominant gospel theme very near the surface. It's, it's implicit in Hinty, and Bill Hyde has made it explicit in his audio productions. And it's just great fun for the family. So you, if this Christmas, it's a great Christmas present for the family. Any of them that he's done would be good. Um, there are a number, Lee and Virginia, Wolf the Saxon, The Reign of Terror for the Temple, Barrack the Briton, um, and others. But I'm going to go with Drake's Flag, the first one, as, as one of the best and one that relates directly to what we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. That's fun. I remember listening to the Cat of Boobasties ah. when I was a, a kid, but we had the one on tape from the library. Mm-hmm. And the way the reader always said it was the Cat of Boobasties, which is <laughs> like this very sing song way of saying the title. <laughs> it's forever ingrained in my memory. But that's fun. All right. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or you can visit our Patreon, patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at halting towards Zion at gmail.com. Um, if you'd like to read transcripts of our shows, 
you can subscribe to our Substack. Um, that is currently the only way to get our transcripts, and you'll get them in your email box. Very convenient. Don't even have to go hunting them down. Mm. All right, I think that is it. Thank you guys so much for listening. We hope to see you next time.